And up next, it is my great pleasure to welcome back to Kai Packer, Ke Fang, who I had the pleasure of sharing an office with while uh, we were <laughs> here. So, uh, um, so uh, Ke received her PhD from the University of Chicago in 2018. Um, she spent a few years as a JSI fellow in Maryland, and then she came here in 2018 as an NHFP Einstein fellow um, until 2020. Um, and since then, she's moved on to a faculty position at um, the University of Wisconsin in Madison, um, where she works on multi-messenger astrophysics with all sorts of particles that come from cosmic sources, photons, neutrinos, and cosmic rays. Um, and she's here today to tell us all about astrophysics at the highest energy frontiers. So uh, take it away, Kerr. Thanks so much, Dan. It's great to be back. And I remember um, I had to, uh, when I left, that was during the pandemic. So I have to make special requests. And the reason I said, yeah, go there for three minutes, three hours, back up and go out. I never get a chance to say goodbye to everyone. It's great to be back to see you and say hi again. So uh, so today I'm, I'm this great pleasure to give in the topic of multi-messengers from the high energy frontier. And Stefan has already give a fantastic introduction about many important aspects of this uh, frontier. So just this plot on the front page give you a sense that for both messengers and high energy, that's why I'm putting it here. So the X axis indicate the energy in electron volts. So one electron volts is where usually the, uh, the, the, uh, I don't think this. Oh, okay. There's a mouse on there. There's a mouse on there. It's okay. It's okay. So one electron volt is roughly where the uh, the optical lights our eyes are sensitive to, and um, and then the um, uh, and the y axis is the distance to the galactic center, the nearest galaxy, nearest blazars, as well as the much larger distances where the a lot of great talk yesterday and a lot of you are working on where uh, where Ruben is interested in. Uh, on the top, I'm showing you the sky maps in radio microwave, uh, which are mostly the beautiful CMBs, and infrared optical, which are usually the distant stars and galaxies, X-rays, uh, where you already started to see the, the, the bubble plus a lot of distant AGNs, plus also the, the galactic plane, gamma rays in Fermilab, and then and then the interesting aspect of multi-messenger in this particular plot shows up at the higher energy. This is because the, if you are using the electromagnetic waves to look at the universe, you will be good all the way till roughly there at TeV energies, where the photons getting so energetic that they start to interact with a background photon. So through a pair interaction, through pair production, so that the universe becomes opaque to photons. You stop seeing your distant universe at a higher energy. That's where the other messengers comes in. For example, you can use neutrinos, which are neutral particles weakly interacting, so they go all the way to the back. And cosmic rays, which is carry a lot of energy, but they are charged, so you have to take into account the effect of magnetic field when you trace them back, because it doesn't really give you any transient signal. And in addition, the gravitational waves. So typically, when we talk about or traditionally, when people talk about high energy astrophysics, this refers to the studies between UV and X-ray um, astronomy. But in the last decades, thanks to the advances of many experiments, specifically in the area of particle astrophysics, you started to see a much bigger energy ranges of the high energy astrophysics. So this particular talk, I'll focus between roughly 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 15 electron volts, where the recent advances of the particle astrophysics and multi-messenger, including neutrinos and gamma rays, sits in. So a little bit more staring on this plot, um, already he heard a great introduction from Stefan again about the Fermi. This is the Fermi map. Um, I mean, of course, this is the host of Fermi here, one of the hosts at Slack, and you see that beautiful model hanging out there, still there. So the, the middle plane, one of the most striking things you see with a sky map of Fermilab is the galactic plane. Galactic plane really stands out. But above and below the plane, you still see some individual point sources that are distant blazars, a lot of them. And then getting higher energies, um, Stefan has given a great introduction about the two different techniques to observe the gamma rays. One is the imaging atmospheric chunk of telescopes. I will cover that in this particular talk. And the other is as a type of uh, detectors it's called air shower detectors. So one of them is in that picture is HAWK, which is stands for High Altitude Water Chunk of Observatory. Um, and this is a sky map that observed by Hawk between 0.1 to 100 TeV energies. This is an equatorial plane, but you can see that most of the sources are sitting in between the, the plane, the bright plane out there. And there's a few nearby extragalactic sources, but they are all really nearby stars, uh, galaxies. 
And then lately, Lasso um, is, which is another air shower gamma detector in China, a lot bigger, the same technique, but a lot bigger, gives you the first image of the sky above 100 TeV. There are a bunch of sources, all galactic, um, and they are sitting in there. And in addition, when you go to even higher energies, the where the photons, as you can imagine, this image directly shows you when you hit hundreds of TeVs, you only see very nearby galactic stuff. So if you want to see more distant stuff, you switch to a different type of messenger. And this is showing you a neutrino map obtained with IceCube shower data specifically. And this is a, a, another opening of another way to looking for distant sources. So these are the skies. So in this particular 30 minute talk, I'm going to cover quickly three parts. First is a very quick view of this sky that is viewed with 100 TeV photons. So electromagnetic waves is a traditional wave messenger that people have been used to observe the sky, but the sky opened up with 100 TeV photons. So the other, this is the highest energy photons, the highest energy in the electromagnetic waves um, that is giving something quite different. And then the second part, I'll quickly scan through what we have known so far about the neutrino sky. And then finally, the, the end part is, is really a recent excitement. Uh, we know that one of the first multi-messenger source is the first neutron star merger, GW170017, because you see gravitational waves and photons from it at the same time, pointing to very different processes. And this year, Milky Way, our old friend, where we are living in, finally becomes a new multi-messenger source. So I'll give a quick um, explanation about that at the end. Started off with the 100 TeV source. So this is a very quick uh, walk through about some of the, the interesting so-called pavatrons we observed with uh, Hawk and Lasso and Air Shower Gamma Ray Observatories in general. Um, and Pavatron, this word itself is a, is a, is a dragon. <laughs> uh, it's a dragon from the, the uh, high energy physics community, meaning the PEV cosmic ray accelerator. But to measure PEV cosmic rays, you have to see photons at hundreds of TeV. That's why this increment of sensitivity to the hundreds of TeV regime is a big deal in uh, revealing some of these new Pavatrons. So this is the sky, all sky view, but among it, there are several several sources. The hunt of Pavatron already started uh, more than 15 years ago from the HAS, which is one of the leading IACTs, and it's still functioning and producing great results. And this is one of the famous detection of a Pavatron at the galactic center. This is a star forming region close to the Sag A star that gets a very hard gamma ray emission up to 30 TeV that gives the first hint of a possible PeV cosmic ray proton acceleration in the galactic center region. And starting uh, shortly after the launches of a hog, we identified another source in that region, uh, close to one of the brightest PEV sources, Malago J1908. And this is, by the way, one of the uh, benefits um, of air shower out over ICTs because air shower give you a wide field observation. So it's possible to see dim sources next to an extended bright source. But of course, ICT has benefits over uh, advances just over air showers, for example, the much better angular resolution and the sensitivity. So in this particular case, we saw this dim little guy next to a bright source and we zoomed it in. Uh, fitting sources, fitting photons at the same time, identified a microquasar, which is actually one of the brightest microquasar in the galaxy and the super, super adding to the crater called SS433. This is, um, so the, the cross in the center is the black hole and then the, uh, the black contours are the jets from the X-ray imaging. And the, the, the colors indicating what we see with HOG. And as you can see that this is the first time a set of astrophysical jets is resolved at such a high energy. And it tells you directly where the particle acceleration happens. It's not close to the hole. It's ended up at a, some intermediate distance in the jet. Then following that, we find another interesting source at the outer uh, galaxy region called Cygnus Cocoon. So this is actually a source originated from Kaipak because it was shortly discovered with Fermilab um, after with two years of Fermilab data. And this is a star formation cocoon um, that is extremely big, two degrees across, as you can see. And the um, and it's coming. Uh, it's it's a region where with lots of OB stars 
stellar clusters bursting. So it's really the stellar winds. This is amazing because normally when you're thinking about particle acceleration, you think about the jets from black holes, neutron stars, and these are ordinary stars. This stellar winds from ordinary stars is already so powerful. So with Hawk, we identified the source, the Cygnus bubble uh, is also shining at hundreds of TeV energies. So the blue contours is the Fermi um, lat cocoon uh, counts so significance ranges. And the, the colors is again, the Hawk significance. As you can see, the TeV and GeV photons nicely coincident, and they all trace us the dust emission region of the, the infrared emission of the Cygnus cocoon. And with additional information about the energy spectrum, we confirm this is the place where very likely proton acceleration is happening. And then there's another source, uh, which is another <laughs> kaipak related work to work together with Roger and Eric here. Uh, it's a nearby uh, supernova remnant, one of the nearest supernova remnant, KG 106.3 plus 2.7. This is the guy that um, also gives you a shine. This is a guy actually now being observed by every single gamma ray observatory up to high hundreds of TeV. And the, in, in the most exciting part is this is a region that shows a indication of a proton acceleration, which gives you a close look. This is one of the type of supernova remnants. People have been, uh, ceratotists have been hypothesized for a long time and ended up to be observed finally with these highest energy telescopes. The, 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 the other source is CRAB, our old friend CRAB. And this CRAB has been observed nicely with synchrotron emission Amos Captain to uh, has been for decades of observation of the source. What's new is Lasso was able to identify a PEV component from this source. So uh, the, the KAIPAC work previously was able to see the synchrotron emission of those PEV electrons. And this time the inverse Compton emission of these PEV electrons was directly imaged by Lasso. So the bottom line here is I have been showing you and walk you through all kinds of the sources. And the exciting part is these are all different type of objects, as you can see. It's like a zoom of sources. It's not one source dominating the whole sky. And then you're looking at this hundreds TeV energies, there are all kinds of sources out there. So it's really like a zoom of objects there. Okay, now the second part, I'll quickly walk you through what we have learned so far about the neutrinos. So neutrinos, just walk back a little bit. This is a huge plot in the sense that we covered more than 50 orders of magnitude in the y-axis, more than 25 orders of magnitude in the x-axis, showing the flux and energy of the neutrinos. So from the left, starting off with the neutrino at 10 to the about 10 to the minus four electron volts, these are the cosmological neutrinos that it's so important exists in all of your large scale structure simulations. Uh, but there are all kinds of indirect evidence about these cosmological neutrinos, but there's no direct detection so far. So it's definitely an interesting frontier for detections. The detection of the neutrinos from supernovae 1987A was awarded the Nobel Prize because of the first detection of the um, neutrinos outside the solar system. Neutrino detection from the sun um, confirms the neutrino oscillation, and that was the 2015 Nobel Prize. At the highest energies, we also expect a population of neutrinos called cosmogenic neutrino. So these are the neutrinos produced when the cosmic rays at the highest energy interact with the CMB. We are sure they are there because we already detected the cosmic rays, we already detected the CMB for sure, and we know the interaction will happen, but these neutrinos so far has not yet been detected. So that's why I'm using the, the dashed curve indicating the non-detected one. The recent observation, which is what I would focus on the next few slides, are the detection of astrophysical neutrinos. And this is made by the Ice Cube Observatory in South Pole. And Ice Cube specifically is 86 strings of photomultiplier uh, put under the ice, go into the bedrock, and this has established the existence of a high energy neutrino population of astrophysical origin. And But the, the major question right now is where do this neutrino come from? We have some hints of the first sources, but still we have no idea where the majority of the sources come from. Even though we have no idea where they are, what they are, we still already gathered a bunch of interesting facts about these neutrino sources, and some of them are very surprising. So here's a list of them. First is we know that they exist, okay? So this is a plot showing you a single flavor neutrino flux as a function of the neutrino energy. The colors indicating different data samples used 
with different selection criteria from the experiment. Some of them you can think of as dominated by muon neutrinos, some of them is dominated by electron tau neutrinos. And the dashed gray curve out there is the atmospheric background. So as you can see that regardless how you select your data, there is a population of neutrinos at the higher energy that cannot be explained by the known background and they have to come from astrophysical origins. So great, the first thing is they exist. The second aspect is even though we have no idea where they come from, we do know that the sources, whatever power these neutrinos are very abundant and powerful. So this is an attempt of us trying to explain the high energy neutrinos using transients that are powered by non-relativistic shocks. So the different colors, the short answer is no, you cannot use non-relativistic transients to explain in these neutrinos. The long answer, slightly longer answer, is that the different colors here indicating a different types of transients, including tidal disruption events, FBOTs, and superluminous supernovae. And then um, a little physics behind it is for all these transients powered up by non-relativistic shocks, their power, their, their shocks at the time when the, the light curve peaks is in a radiative phase. So the optical luminosity give you a good estimate about the total power carried by these shocks. That's how we can use their optical observations to, 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 to estimate the total amount available energy to accelerate the protons to produce the neutrinos. So if we only require 100% um, of all the proton, uh, all the uh, energies available in these shocks to accelerate protons, you could explain these neutrinos. In other words, this is too hard to make these transients only to explain this neutrino. And the sources have to be something even longer term, like energy and jets. And finally, the third aspect is also surprising in the sense that the neutrino sources seems to be gamma ray opaque. This is evident from both individual sources. Here is showing you one of the first neutrino sources, NGC 1068, which was a result published last year. And here is a broadband energy spectral distribution of this one of the first uh, nearby typical safer galaxy. And the um, the, 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 sorry, the, the, the blue color is the uh, neutrino detection. The band out there is the neutrino detection inferred from counts of the events in that direction of NGC 1068. And the green uh, data points and upper limits corresponds to the GEV observation by Fermilat and TEV uh, observation upper limits by MAGIC. So you can see that the neutrino flux is, um, if confirmed, this is exactly NGC 1068, this at least two orders of magnitude higher than the gamma ray flux. So in other words, this is almost scary when you're thinking about it, that when you put on a neutrino lens, you see a source that's 100 times brighter, 100 times more energy that was not seen before with electromagnetic waves. And this fact that they are gamma ray opaque is also evident from looking at the diffuse flux and the isotropic gamma ray background measured by Fermilab. This is because, as I told you, these hundreds of TeV photons, which are produced together with the neutrino on a wider boy, will cascade in the electromagnetic, uh, in, the, in the CMB and the infrared background lights. So this cascade is going to showing up in the infrared, uh, in, the, in the isotropic gamma ray background, which is already in tension with what Fermilab has seen with the background. So this additional suggests that the sources, at least part of the gamma rays produced together with the neutrinos, would have already been attenuated at the source. So the sources are gamma ray opaque and likely different. The neutrino sources are likely, very likely different from the gamma ray sources. Okay, just as the last few minutes, I'm going to just title is multi-messengers and the really fun about multi-messengers is put together neutrinos and gamma rays on all the different type of information together. So the Milky Way has been seen, of course, in all the wavelengths and very recently at the highest energies in photon as well. The first, the game starts uh, in 2021 when TBAT AS Gamma, which is another air shower gamma observatory in China, um, observed a excess of photons from the galactic plane region at the energy of 400 TeV, above 400 TeV. So you can see there's excess there. So this year, it also did a more accurate observation of the galactic diffuse emission. Specifically, they look at two patches uh, that are accessible to their detector, and these are the, the planes. And then they removed the, uh, they masked all the bright sources on the plane, and then detected a residual emission at the level of more than 10 sigma, and that is the diffuse emission from the plane. 
And excitingly, this year, IceCube also published its first observation of the galactic coin. So this is a uh, image showing the multi-wavelength observation of the Milky Way, because the events used for this analysis is the cascade events, which are made mostly by the shower, by the neutrino and tau neutrinos, uh, electron and tau neutrinos. They have pretty big angular resolutions. So this, at the end, is the neutrino emission at the very end. And this is detected at a 4.5 post-trial significance level. So the neutrino, the galactic plane, finally become a multi-messenger source itself, emitting both neutrinos and photons. But the real fun part is what do we learn with these multi-messenger observations of the plane? So to, to understand these, we first need to have this basic sense about the neutrino and gamma detections. The gamma, the neutrino detection is full sky, like Fermi lab, but the, the gamma detection is only partial sky because they are on the ground. So this plot summarizes the so far uh, detected region in a gamma ray air shower gamma ray detectors, as well as IACTs, surveys by IACTs. So the boxes along the galactic plane indicating the regions where the diffuse emission of the galactic plane has been measured in gamma ray band. And the circles out there indicating the field of view of the Hawk and the Lasso, which tells you where the sources are observed. And the red box shows the survey area by Hass. Uh, which is a um, which is in the difference. This is the only available survey data in the southern hemisphere so far. So what we did, uh, right? So it's complicated to so for neutrinos, it's a full sky. So you can compare neutrino and gamma ray by either scale down neutrino data to the gamma ray region or scale up the gamma ray region to compare it with the full sky. It's hard to do it in the first way because neutrino detection remembering only is at level of four sigma. So you cannot divide the sky into smaller pieces. That's why we scaled up the, the gamma rays by assuming that the region with no detection is going to follow the same source distribution as the northern sky for air shower gamma ray detectors like Lasso and the Hawk. So by doing that, we already first at the time of a TBAT 2021 predicted the associated neutrino uh, related to the TBAT gamma ray uh, diffuse emission from the plane. This red region, uh, sorry, per, uh, orange region is what our prediction. And this was what detect was detected this year in 2023 with IceCube. The perfect agreement of IceCube and TBAT give you a sense that the diffuse emission above 400 TeV observed by TBAT has to come from hadronic emission. So the gamma rays can only can be made both by electrons and protons. The fact that the neutrino flux is very comparable to the gamma ray flux converted from a model assuming 100% of the proton is producing the 100% of the gamma ray come from protons, giving you a, a, a very clear understanding about the origin of these emissions in gamma rays. And then the last observation we see this year is a more careful diffuse background after subtracting the, back, the, the sources, which is lower than TBAT and IceCube. And then if we adding up the individual sources that are likely hadronic um, in the sense of non, not related powered by pulsars, then you ended up finding, concluding that the diffuse emission observed by IceCube is likely dominated by the diffuse emission, especially at a higher energy, but there is a non-negligible contribution of the sources that are currently not reserved, not resolved by IceCube. Another piece of information, which is also exciting, is really fun to notice is the, if you're just looking at the sky map that is observed by gamma rays and neutrinos, as I said, the first thing you notice in the gamma ray map is our own galactic plane. But when you're looking at this in the neutrino map, the galactic plane is not really that outstanding. This translates into a intensity map. This is a four pi in averaged intensity of the neutrinos and gamma rays. Neutrinos in blue and gamma rays in red. This is for galactic emission with a summarizing of what we have learned so far. But if you plot the actual galactic emission, you can see it's almost reversed. So the galactic um, intensity of the galactic plane in gamma ray is much higher, an order of magnitude higher than the actual galactic intensity, whereas the four pi average intensity of the neutrino sky is, a, is an order of magnitude larger than the galactic plane. What this really says is that the neutrino luminosity of our own Milky Way is very low. And, and distant, it, even with, uh, with the help of a geometry, our own galactic plane doesn't stand out. So a actual galactic Milky Way-like galaxy is going to be orders of magnitude brighter than our own Milky Way. So we are sitting in a desert of neutrinos.
that gives me to the summary. So hopefully this is a quick walkthrough of the latest results with the air shower gamma ray observatories with Hawk and the Lasso hitting the highest energy photon at photon uh, wavelength, photon energy. And then IceCube has established a diffuse flux of astrophysical neutrinos. And even though we have no idea what they are, we do have some interesting facts about these sources and which uh, the basic conclusion is they look very different from the gamma ray sky. And finally, all of these results will hopefully improve with the um, existing ice cube upgrade, hopefully coming in the winter of 2025, and also the next generation detectors such as SWGO brought up in the last talk, as well as ice cube gen 2. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you Claire, for that super interesting talk. And we've got time for one or two questions. Uh, watch it. So you talked a bit at the end about the tension between the lasso results and the neutrino background. Um, one thing I, I'm curious about and worrying a little bit about is the log n log s at PV may not be that well understood. How confident are we that the tension is not even worse and that more of the lasso sources aren't point sources? Yeah, that's a great question. So the log n log s has been studied with the Hass Galactic Plane Survey. Uh, sources, which is, but it's only a, a, in the inner galaxy region. The log and log s of the air shower gamma detectors have not been studied. Uh, but that's a good question. But on the other hand, we have been thought about that. Uh, if I can do this very quickly. Here is a piece of important information is TBAT and IceCube are both just the whole plane. So there's no source re uh, resolved or unresolved there. So one solid uh, conclusion you can obtain from this type of comparison with the consistency of the ice cube and TBAT with the assumption of the fact that the source distribution in the regions not resolved by TBAT is the same with the other part of the sky is that regardless of the contribution of the resolved or unresolved sources, in these two cases, all the sources are unresolved. You're just comp comp uh, comparing the, the plane. So in these two cases, the emission, the flux is comparable so that the dominant, the, the mechanism dominating this gamma ray emission at the highest energy has to be hadronic. That is safe to conclude. But agree with you that the contribution of unresolved sources can definitely contribute, especially at the lower energy to the neutrino band from the, both the unresolved from Lasso and unresolved from the, the ice cube. Stefan. Yes, thanks for this very nice talk. Um, the, the, can you talk a little bit more about the fact that the Milky Way is so faint in neutrinos, what I mean, what could be a reason for that? It's, uh, thanks for the question. It's really fun. So we we try to be here is model independent or or the the colors indicate can uh, indicating the uncertainties of the model we use, but we make no assumption of the sources that are making these neutrinos and gamma rays. But if you're thinking about why we are living in a desert of neutrinos here, like we're thinking about why Milky Way is Milky Way, a different place from the other uh, places, then we ended up in the neutrino world is definitely a different place. And there are several possibilities here. The first is um, if PEV cosmic rays protons are accelerated, they could only be contained in a, gal in a galactic magnetic field for a few million years. And if we had no, say, major outburst of the, the, the AGN in our center of the galaxy, then the protons from the last episodes, which is likely from that amount of time, has already left the, the Milky Way. So that's why we don't see that a major, and we don't have active AGN either. So that could partly explain why we are much fainter than the distant galaxies or the distant neutrino sources. So that's one possibility, um, but in general, any processes that the Milky Way does not have in the past few million years can make this difference. Okay, thanks. Hey, and we probably have time for one more quick question. Um, if not, um, I can ask. Um, so I was interested when you, you showed that the, the neutrino luminosities of some of those sources like 1068 were so much higher than the, the gamma ray luminosities. Mm -hmm. Does that tell us something about the energy budget of the accelerator between the neutrinos and the electromagnetic radiation, or is it just that the electromagnetic radiation is getting scattered? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, maybe that doesn't take too long to go back. Yes. So the these these dotted points I didn't have time to explain are the 
uh, in the, the broadband spectral energy distribution from radio. And I think it's picked around up infrared and then there's optical and the UV scattered all around. So that gives you a sense about the bolometric luminosity of this galaxy. So luckily the neutrino flux is not hitting the top yet, but it does take a lot of the energy of the, 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 the active jets of the AGN or the black hole that's accreting. So, and the fact that the neutrino flux is about a hundred times brighter than the gamma ray actually put, um, it's a great headache for Cirrus to explaining the scenario. And what it essentially boils down to is the region where the neutrino production happens has to be extremely opaque to gamma rays. So it has to be very efficient in attenuating GeV to TeV photons. And some of the models is now putting the neutrino accelerator, the particle accelerator neutrino emitter at the corona region of the AGM. And, and actually we also have a, I also worked with, um, um, with, with uh, Kaipak, some of the Kaipak members on a model and putting, it's also very close to the core of the AGM, uh, but it has to be a very small condensed region. Interesting, thanks a lot. Well, uh, let's thank Kurt again.